with Thanksgiving coming up this weekend, I thought I would share the Backyard Variety Tours favorite Thanksgiving movies and television. Starting things off, we're going to go with The Ice Storm. This is an Ang Lee movie. I believe it's from 1997. You got your Tobey Maguire character coming home for Thanksgiving from college, I believe. It's got an even bleaker vibe than American Beauty, I would say, in the sense of the all-American perfect kind of family. At least that's what this family is trying to be. It's not too heavy, though. It does have some bleak moments. It's heavy on the fall weather. You know, um, fall is a big significance of change. I know I always had a different feeling when it was fall and it was September and I was going back to school for a different year and big change was always on the horizon in fall. Um, you know, leaves are falling, seasons changing. Deals with heavy moments of despair at times. I would say you really feel what these characters are feeling because they're similar things to what we would feel, you know. Um, kind of like love for a girl, love for a wife, love for a daughter or a son, and the complications that go goes into all those relationships. So you got the Toby Maguire character, the college kids coming home, going after the girl, you know, visiting the city, not really wanting to spend time with your family, doing drugs with your friends, getting drunk, that kind of stuff. You have the elementary school kids also being ignored by their family and just being left alone. Um, they're dealing with like body transformations, hormones, curiosity. You've got like a young Elijah Wood and a young Christina Ricci, um, maybe playing like grade six, seven or eight, something like that. Yeah, some weird scenes, some weird scenes with them. I, know there's a, I remember there's a weird bathroom scene with one of the brothers and he freaks out because Christina Ricci is her character is so much more advanced than, uh, like sexually, than the other kids, than the boys. So you've got, you've also got adults dealing with secrets and adultery. And I find that this film basically is saying that no one is acting responsible. And why should the kids be held to act responsible if their parents are such a mess? and miserable and acting irresponsible as well. And it's the kind of movie where all these characters goes back to that all American perfect family where everyone is kind of faking it on the forefront and not being who they really are or acting how they really feel. I find that loss of innocence is uh, a recurring theme and it's kind of like even no matter how old you are, because there's, you know, wives cheating on husbands, um, you know, young kids kind of discovering their bodies. And it, this goes back to the fall theme, deals with characters going through changes and major life transformations. Um, now, this is a movie from the 90s. I can't recall if it's supposed to be take place in the 70s. I'd have to double check that. Maybe it's just supposed to take place in the 90s. But there is a key bowl swinger party with the parents, which makes me feel like it's the 70s and it was a period piece, but that's uh, to be discovered. It's directed by Ang Lee, as mentioned, and from the stuff that I've seen by him, you know, Life of Pi, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, I haven't seen Brokeback, but um, I should, just because it's Hall and Heath Ledger. I think one thing that... Uh, I kind of found funny about Brokeback is I didn't really find it maybe they do end up wearing makeup near the end like for their older versions of themselves maybe they age them but I never really found like it's pretty much like a 20 year old Jake Gyllenhaal and a 20 year old Heath Ledger supposed to be playing these like old tired rugged cowboys you know it's just that's one thing that I just find too unbelievable about it okay back to the ice storm so it's definitely an afternoon type flick because it's heavy but it's hopeful there's there's some like hopeful and I mean I love it as a movie it is a great movie but it's definitely heavy and if you can take that kind of stuff without letting it like 
ruin, like if you don't mind a slow movie or a movie that's just a bit different or whatever, um, it kind of file, falls into a heavy thought, thought provoking, I would say, film. So that's the ice storm. Another Thanksgiving classic. Great for the whole family, full of adultery and despair. Just another Thanksgiving charmer. Okay. Okay, next on the list, we have The Simpsons, Bart versus Thanksgiving. Oh, yeah, getting back to the ice storm for a second. I don't know where you can find this movie. It used to be on Netflix sometimes, or it used to be on, I think, maybe Crave. But it's not around anymore. And I don't know why. What is the deal? Why is it that the American Netflix can hold, like, all the movies in the world and the Canadian Crave or Canadian Netflix is, like, churning some in and churning some out? And I often find that, like, there'd be a movie sitting around. And you'd be like, I don't feel like watching that right now. But then, like, a month later, I'd be like, oh, you know what? That was on Netflix and I kind of do feel like watching it now. And I'd look for it and it'd be gone. Fuck you, Netflix. And, and crave and fuck you for doing all that shit. Get it together. Just leave the shit on there. Put it on there. Leave it on there. <sighs> okay. Serenity now. Serenity now. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. The Simpsons, Bart versus Thanksgiving. So, this is available on Disney. Season 2, Episode 7, Bart ruins Lisa's Thanksgiving centerpiece, and after being sent to his room with no food, ventures through Springfield with Santa's little helper in search of a Thanksgiving meal. Um, when he gets sent to his room with no food, kind of reminds me of that other episode, I think, where he's bad in school and he's not supposed to get dinner, which is kind of a funny kid thing I feel like was around when I was growing up, where if you're bad, you get sent to your room with no dinner. And one thing I thought was cute in that episode it reminded me of was I remember Homer sneaking up at the end of the night and sneaking Bart some food and Bart was still a dick about it, knowing that, which reminds me of another thing of Meadow Soprano knowing she got away with it when she pulled that wool over her eyes and just like lost her credit card. So that's a reoccurring thing and uh, kind of a connection because we'll get to a Sopranos episode later. So Bart gets sent to his room, no food, such a kid thing. Um, one other kid thing I noticed early on in the episode is he offers to help Marge cook. Um, which is something I feel like kids kind of did. They feel like they wanted to speed the process along or just be helpful, um, get a spur a moment of wanting to be helpful but not following all the way through with um, the effort for it actually to be helpful. So Bart offers to help Marge cook, and she says, sure, do the cranberries, and he basically can't open the can, can't find the can opener. Once she does that stuff for him anyways, um, he just basically drops it in a bowl and then just leaves and thinks his job is done. So sometimes causing more work and not helping at all. Great cameos in this episode by Grandpa Simpson and great quotes by Grandpa Simpson and Marge's sisters. Um, but Marge's mom takes the cake for one-liners in this episode. Every one-liner of hers is dynamite and she just roasts everyone. She doesn't hold back at all. She's cutthroat, and it's hilarious. The episode has a lot of heart, probably more so than usual, I would say, because it's pretty sweet. Once Bart actually does venture home, he kind of realizes that he's talking with some bums, and through just talking with them, something that he unintentionally kind of says is that he has a family to go home to. And they say, like, that must be nice. And he's like, yeah, I guess it kind of is. So he kind of realizes something very important there. And he does venture home. He ends up climbing his treehouse and sees all his lost toys on the roof. And he's playing on the roof. And then he hears Lisa crying and then brings her up to the roof. And they kind of have a heart-to-heart. -heart. And he kind of realizes, she convinces him to look within himself and see what he did wrong. And he does find that spark. And that spark gets brought up in a couple episodes. I think Marge says it in an episode later where she's like, you know, Bart's not a bad kid. He's just got this spark or something. So that's like a reoccurring uh, thing there as well. And basically, he apologizes. And they hug it out. And they end up eating leftover 
turkey um, turkey sandwiches together in the kitchen at the end. The dog and cat are there too, and it's kind of like a heartfelt, nice ending, nice and touching. Um, so there's another one that's in here that I'm just going to touch on very briefly, just because it's such a classic, but it's on like everybody's list ever, and that's planes, trains, and automobiles. So you can find it on Prime Video with the sub subscription to Super Channel, which is way too expensive for what it is, $9.99 for a channel that I think went bankrupt last year and doesn't have too many movies available on it. And again, I don't know why Planes and Trains isn't available on your typical streaming services, especially around this time of year. It's like a Thanksgiving and Christmas or whatever classic. So, so the best thing about planes and trains, in my opinion, I love, you know, they're driving the wrong way on the highway and those people are yelling at them, you're going the wrong way. And he's like, keep drinking, <laughs> keep drinking, pal. And how does he know which way we're going? Just amazing. That's probably my favorite part. And when he turns into the devil and he's just laughing as they go in between those two transports, just the best. That's the best. And it doesn't get any better than John Candy or Steve Martin, really. And when you put them together, how can you go wrong? Just a couple of guys going home for Thanksgiving. And John Candy's story is so sad. How is it so sad in every movie? And that he just pulls you in and just breaks your heart for him in every movie. Because he's always got like a lost family or lost son or he's never around his family or Oh my God, just heartbreaking. Love him so much. Okay, moving on. Rocky. Now you can get this on Prime Video with the sub subscription to MGM, which is affordable. It's only like $3.99, $4.99, or $5.99, something like that. And you do get a ton of awesome movies with that one. Okay, so Rocky, it's not really a Thanksgiving movie per se, but there is a Thanksgiving scene where Rocky gets invited over to Adrian's house and Adrian's brother, Polly loses his shit and I think he throws the turkey out the window or he throws it across the room or something that she spent all day cooking and preparing this meal and Polly's kind of a huge asshole in this movie um, great actor I forget the guy's name Bert something um, you know Rocky who doesn't love a feel good underdog story before or after holiday feast this is kind of I feel like that's where this movie fits in you know, you either, right, you're leading up to a meal or after a meal, you sit down and relax and you throw on Rocky. And it's probably not going to make you feel good because he's going to be in great shape and doing all this stuff. And you're going to be like, Ugh, I love gravy. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, going to fly now. Theme song is always good to get the blood boiling, jack you up, make you feel like a fat pig while you're slopped over in your favorite chair. Um, the best part of the montage is watching him hustle. Um, you know, in the first one, when no one cares about him, um, no one really cares about him. He's running through the city. It's just epic and beautiful scenery anyways, but it's all this gritty, and he's running alone. And it's a great shot. Um, what is it? It's like a horizontal shot where he's running, and then all of a sudden, sudden he starts kicking it into high gear, and he's alone, and there's no one there. And then they copy the same scene in the second one, and actually in the second one, I feel like it's more impactful. Um, but you got to get the juice from the first one to really feel that impact, because in the second one, everyone's following him and chasing after him. And when they do that same side shot, chills just run through me when he's kicking it into high gear, and he just breaks away from the crowd, and you're like, oh... Wow, yeah, so um, one thing that that essentially is teaching you is from from version one to being alone to version two to being surrounded by everyone is you got to hustle in the dark to shine in the light. Moving on, North by Northwest, Crave TV. Apparently this is a Thanksgiving movie. This is one that I didn't look into, but it's on my list here to check out. It's the only one of the bunch I put in that I didn't look into, and I guess that means i got to watch it this weekend. So I'll find out why North by Northwest should be considered a Thanksgiving movie. But maybe if you want to find out, that's one you can also find out yourself. Moving on, Knives Out. Now, this is not necessarily a Thanksgiving movie per se, but it does deal heavily with fall and autumn vibes. So this time of year is very prominent in the film. Lots of wind and leaves and color. 
um, you know, um, barren trees, stuff like that. Really good stuff. Really good look and vibes in this. Now it's easily available on simply prime video on its own. And I mean, this movie just came out kind of thing. Like it came out like even a couple months ago, I think it was in theaters for a very short time and then came out all of a sudden. Um, it's great. So Ryan Johnson directed by Ryan Johnson and this is a good little detective thing. It's not even hard to follow. It's just kind of entertaining and funny. Um, like I said, it's got that autumn feel, leaves in the wind, Thanksgiving kind of family gathering feel. Everyone's there to hear the will, um, to kind of find out who gets the money. And it's a little bit of a whodunit mystery for... Now, here's kind of where it's untraditional because it's a whodunit mystery for the characters, but not the audience, which is kind of a change of pace because normally you want everyone to be in the dark and realizing everything as it unravels, and the audience should never be too far ahead of the character, and vice versa. So this is a strange whodunit mystery where the audience knows everything that's going on but no one else does, but maybe that's where the humor, a little bit of humor and stuff comes in. It's a star-studded affair, okay? There's so many people in this who could be leading actors in their own right in any movie. Um, Christopher Plummer, who it's still incredible that this guy is just churning up movies, and he's probably like the most incredible old guy actor around to play these <laughs> like so intense parts, like Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. He filled in on that uh, money... All the Money in the World movie. Um, he was in that Adam McGoyan movie recently. Like, this guy is still killing it. And um, he just keeps getting those good roles of these old guys. He's like the best. There's probably no one who can compete with him on that dramatic level right now. Um, Michael Shannon, you know, hilarious Don Johnson. Um, I'm missing tons of people. Who is that guy in Sorry to Not Bother You? He had a great year with like three amazing movies. Oh yeah, so it's funny, it's entertaining, and even though it's supposed to be a mystery, it doesn't really ask much of its audience. It doesn't ask much of you, other than just to kind of sit back and enjoy. It's very uncomplicated, you know? Just sit back and enjoy, let the movie kind of wash over you and, and take from it what you will. One thing I didn't really like about it is that it's political. They throw in a lot of modern, they don't mention Trump's name, but they talk about kids being in cages and stuff. So it kind of time stamps itself, which I didn't like. And it was almost just for one scene. So it felt very like for the glorification of the filmmaker to get his political views across alone because it didn't really tell too much more. It didn't reveal more about the characters. I already kind of knew they were douchebags and probably could have already easily guessed that they would have been on the side of a green with that stuff. So I felt like that was kind of the filmmaker spoiling themselves. But there is one during that scene where they're all kind of sitting around talking about that political stuff, this very subtle um, moment that I love when Don Johnson is trying to get uh, Marta, I believe, who's the maid, and he's trying to pretend to kind of include her in the conversation and, and hear her point or wants to pretend he kind of wants to hear her point of view. But I think it's to kind of like make her look bad. And um, as he's doing that, he's like, oh, I just want to include her. And he's like handing her his empty plate that he was just like snacking with food on. He's like, oh, I'm just trying to be. And he just does it so subtly. It's just this beautiful moment that kind of I think would probably go unnoticed by a lot of people. OK, moving on. The Last Waltz. Now, this is available on Crave TV. This is a documentary concert film, um, probably close to like one of the first. I mean, there couldn't have been too many being made around then. I know Scorsese was kind of the guy who was making these movies for the Stones and, um, and obviously the band here. So I would say this film ramps up in a very beautiful way that like the spirit and everything kind of takes a couple songs for like the spirit and everything to kind of wash over you and really wrap you in uh, rope you in and just kind of like I don't know get you on board completely and it's got a very special vibe so that's why I bring it up that it feels like a very great Thanksgiving or Christmas film in a way I think I watched it last Christmas and it, and it gave me a really good feeling 
And yeah, so it really ramps up and really evolves as a grandiose performance as it goes. Once all these music, once everything starts unraveling, you realize how grandiose it actually is and how well it's done and how hard it must have been to actually make this on film. Like today, everything's so easy for everyone. Digital, 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 shoot, 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 whatever. Like back then you had to be so careful and so precise. And that's why these people were so talented because they were that in the hardest scenario. It's much easier to be more talented now with this stuff. So, and the reason why it reminds me of kind of Thanksgiving and Christmas, and it's kind of sitting right in between, it's because the performance was held um, on my birthday, actually a decade before my birthday, uh, on American Thanksgiving, November 25th, 1976. So sitting right there in the middle of Canadian Thanksgiving and Christmas, and I feel like it's got a really special uh, vibe. And actually, I read that they treated everyone, it says here, um, it started at 5 p.m., and the audience of 5,000 people was served turkey dinners beforehand. And then the performance started around 9 p.m., so that sounds pretty wild and reminds me a little bit of that scene in Man on the Moon when Andy Kaufman takes everybody in the theater out for milk and cookies. And it's actually this really uh, heartwarming thing. He organized buses and it was this really impromptu thing. And uh, I don't know if that's a real story, but I certainly hope it is. Directed by Martin Scorsese, shot by Vilmos Siegmund. So this guy is a very famous cinematographer who did a lot of Scorsese films and who did a lot of Steven Spielberg films. And it's just one of the guys who's at top of this game. I'd say it's him and uh, Roger whatever, who are kind of like the modern veterans right now, contemporary veterans who are still kind of shooting the highest, um, highest caliber stuff. I'm going to squeeze in a water break here. Jesus, loosen my voice. Yeah, so this, the last waltz, very nostalgic. You know, it really captures a moment in time. And it's very sad in a way, this band's last performance being captured um and the stories they tell the little in-betweens i don't know there's something very special about it and yeah it's kind of sad watching it knowing that this was their final show stepping away from the nostalgic stuff to the ultra dramatic stuff we're going to look at prisoners available on crave tv so this is definitely the darkest film in the list i would say the reason why it's in my thanksgiving list is because the daughter goes missing on thanksgiving she disappears on thanksgiving and it's definitely one of the deepest darkest movies i think i've seen um now sure some things are probably amped up and glorified for dramatic effect but i would say i didn't give this movie its dues when it first came out so you know i think it came out sometime in about 2013 or something like that i think i watched it once and was like oh yeah like very well made film and whatever but didn't really take it all in and it wasn't until repeat views i think i watched it a second time and i was like oh oh i don't understand this movie at all and then I had to watch it like a third and fourth and fifth time. And as it went and went, it was just more and more enjoyment because I started understanding every word of dialogue, all the layers. The layers in that movie are unbelievable. Um, it really asks a lot of the audience. So it's very different from Knives Out because it really asks a lot of you to pay attention, to listen, to think. <clears throat> and to understand and because it doesn't give you a lot of answers you have to figure it out and put things together for yourself and it really has some amazing performances i love that Hall added the little his character gets like an eye twitch that was added strictly by him um because and i think i heard this on a commentary or something because his character didn't really have much he did have to bring something special to that character and I think he really pulled off the whole like sleep deprived, loner, pretty good. Almost like McConaughey did in True Detective season one. So director Denny Villeneuve, probably the biggest Canadian director in the world. He's directing the biggest Hollywood movies, um, Dune and Blade Runner. And they came after this. He did two movies with Jill and Hall back to back. One was a super indie called Enemy filmed in Toronto. Um, actually takes place in Toronto too, I believe. 
Um, I don't know if they mention it, but there's there's shots of it, and you can see a bunch of U of T, and there's a car crash under the Gardner Expressway. Um, kind of a cool movie about a doppelganger. Jake Gyllenhaal sees his doppelganger in a movie, and um, kind of goes from, tries to track him down. Kind of goes from there. It's kind of interesting. And then him and Denny Villeneuve did Prisoners as well, so they did those two movies back to back. So again, Prisoners is so layered. You know, had to watch it many times to understand it all. Love the ending. Got some Radiohead playing at the end there, and super sweet. Really have to pay attention to every detail, every shot, and every line because it doesn't explain much. You have to put a lot of a lot of it together yourself. And it has one of the greatest shots in film history which is a slow, silent dolly in on a tree in the front yard with the house on the background. And apparently that shot was just an impromptu shot and producers and everyone were kind of pissed that they were wasting time. And then it turned out, once they actually saw the movie, it turned out that that was one of everyone's favorite shots. And the shot doesn't explain anything. It's just a shot tree. I don't even, you got to, it's just like, what the hell does this shot mean? But it's awesome. Next, American Gangster, Crave TV. Again, not a, a huge Thanksgiving movie, but has Thanksgiving elements. At the very beginning, they're handing out turkeys out of the back of a truck. Kind of your stip- stereotypical mob thing to do. This is why people of the community love the mob so much, because they, the mob takes care of them in these ways. And they're kind of like, take from the rich... Well, the mobs kind of like take from everybody and give to the poor and give to themselves and whatever, give to their community. Yeah, so it doesn't have a ton to do with Thanksgiving other than a few snippets here and there. It does have a lot of family dinner scenes um, that kind of feel like Thanksgiving. Um, One great thing about this movie is I could listen to Ted Levine's voice all day. It's almost sounding as, as raspy as mine right now. Let's see if I can impersonate it where it's like, I don't want to do organizing a team of cops. Something like that. I don't know. You got to watch it just for... So Ted Levine, he's in a bunch of Scorsese movies. He's in Shutter Island. He's in a bunch of movies. Great supporting character. He was Buffalo Bill in Silence of the Lambs. The guy's like, would you fuck me? I'd fuck me. So good. So... Ted Levine, yeah. Um, nice big family meal, scene, meal scenes. Um, one great moment. He calls his family in like North Carolina or whatever. Jesus. So he calls his family in North Carolina and he invites them up because he bought them like a big house. And um, he buys his mom a house essentially and he brings the whole family up and takes care of them. And the lady who plays Denzel's mom in this is probably the best actor in the whole thing i would say like there's so many scenes where she outshines denzel and i would say simply because her performance is required to be like shocked at times and like overwhelmed and that must be super hard stuff to pull off and they get this like cute little old lady who's in there who's just like oh my word and just the way she does it is like just like the feels just wash over you you're just like oh my god this poor lady so she really pulls it off well. And halfway through a Thanksgiving dinner of Denzel's family, um, all rich. Oh yeah, so it's a good kind of comparison showing the effect. Sopranos did this a lot where you saw kind of the effect of the Sopranos work against the everyday people that are kind of affected by it. Um, so halfway through this, you know, it shows Denzel's family all rich, eating their fancy meal together, laughing, having a good time, contrasted with showing um, where their money comes from, which is selling the drugs, which is showing all like the dead people who are overdosing and, you know, um, fucking dead babies or, or whatever babies in bad situations and with, with, uh, dead passed out parents beside them on a mattress in a shitty apartment, that kind of stuff. So that blue magic, baby, that's dangerous stuff. Don't do that blue magic. And finally, um, as promised before the connection with the Sopranos available on Crave TV, Season 3, Episode 7, He is Risen. Um, so Season 3 dealt heavily with Jackie Aprile Jr. Um, so Jackie Aprile was Tony's best friend who died in Season 1. 
and that him dying kind of made Tony boss or pseudo boss with kind of junior there a little bit, if you know the show. Season three, Jackie April Jr., who's basically a wannabe, who's basically the biggest idiot who wants to be a mobster, but he's just a moron. Um, so he kind of is a pain in Tony's side. And not only that is his acting kind of stepfather at the time. Um, is Ralph Cifaretto, who doesn't get along with Tony. Even though they, it says they went back as kids and stuff like that, known each other a long time, they're not getting along right now. So Tony and Ralph have a whole Western standoff vibe. You know, they kind of approach each other. Even the Western music is kind of playing. And they're just not getting along. <laughs> There's like drink refusal, talking refusal, all that kind of, they're kind of being dicks to each other. So the Tony and Ralph conflict... And they've already kind of been in major conflict because Ralph disrespected the Bing. He killed a girl there who kind of was annoying Tony, but he still like loved her and thought she was beautiful and stuff. But anyways, so they're kind of at, at odds. And Tony and Ralph conflicts ends up with Tony having Carmela cancel her Thanksgiving invite to Ro and Ralph and Jackie, who end up having this uh, lonely, boring Thanksgiving dinner. Um, it's so... Um, kind of pathetic but the other thing is even though sopranos has more people at theirs it's a bit more lively it's really not that much more lively though because they've got a narcoleptic guy there who's just like passing out they're like whatever i think do they throw bread at him or something like that yeah the narcoleptic aaron i think it's is it one of janice's boyfriends at the time oh so this episode showcases the beginning of the breaking ground on the esplanade waterfront construction project which becomes a big money making and conflict storyline pretty much until the end of the series because it's construction all the way through so i even think that there's like no show jobs that they get where there's a bunch of shit that happens at the construction site when they're just the mobsters are just sitting around collecting their no show jobs i think that's probably all still esplanade getting built or whatever so there's also a big component of johnny sack from new york being infiltrated and being part of the whole money making i think carmine gets involved and i think it might all be because of Polly's big mouth that they find out about it and that means tony's got to start losing money by starting to split his profits with people and divide it up so yeah it's the it's the beginning of the end for ralph Sifaretto and tony soprano this is where the relationship really hits the rocks and they've just had enough of each other's antics and they're talking about pretty much whacking Ralph the entire episode. Um, so He Is Risen is a metaphorical, the title of the episode is a metaphorical reference for almost every character. You can look at every character in the show and kind of adapt that He Is Risen mentality. So Jackie Jr. enters the series as the son of Tony's dead best friend. Um, it's almost like April has come back to life. You know, he has risen. His his bloodline has risen. Ralph gets made capo. This is strictly based on Gigi's death because Gigi eats too much turkey and is constipated and has a heart attack on the toilet. And he was a capo. And he's just stressed and whatever else. So he has a heart attack on the toilet and dies. And Tony has to make Ralph captain. There's this hilarious scene at Gigi's funeral where I think someone says, who are you going to make captain? And he looks over the crew of numbnuts like they might as well have just been picking their nose. Some are just like drifting off and looking off into space. And then you see Ralph and he's just kind of tickering away. His mind's just kind of moving. And Tony knows even though he hates him, he's got to make him captain. Because if he makes one of the other guys captain, it's going to fall apart. Can't have some guy picking his nose, running things. So Ralph gets made capo, which is risen in stature, power, and rank. So he is risen as well. Due to Gigi's death, um, he is risen to heaven. And Tony and his libido are reawakened. He is risen um, by a new Kumar in Gloria Trillo, and so on and so on. So um, that's pretty much it. That's the Thanksgiving roundup. I hope you guys enjoy it. I hope you can um, at least maybe catch some of these movies over the Thanksgiving break. And I know I'll be checking out North by Northwest because it's the only one I didn't get to look at and make notes about before this video. So enjoy. Enjoy.